we are going to finish up talking about never giving up. Um, we started this a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, and this is our fourth and final part of it. Just as a brief way of reminder about the different things we've talked about. Why shouldn't you give up? Why don't we give up? Well, the reasons that we looked at, there are more reasons. The Bible's full of reasons, but we looked at, we're looking at four specific reasons. So the first one, because it's about God, not us. You know, we have this way of making it all about us, but it, it's about God. I mean, oh, I can't do this anymore. Well, that, it's not about you. It's about God. You know, it's, I, I, uh, I just don't know where to go in life anymore. Well, it's not really about your direction in life. It's about God. You know, it's, it's something different. When you go through like a chronic uh, health issue kind of kind of thing, the, the thing is, is it kind of humbles you because men have it in them to just kind of uh, kind of be sufficient and, you know, uh, be a provider and, and a protector and those kinds of things. But when you when you go through health issues, you kind of lose a bit of that, and it's a little bit hard to because you feel like you lose a, a bit of your identity. Um, and uh, so it's just something that you that you learn that it's not about you or your strength or your accomplishments or where your life is headed. It's, a, it's about God. And uh, then we looked at uh, two weeks ago, um, we shouldn't give up because, like Galatians tells us, Something will eventually come of it. If you don't give up, I mean, some, there will be a result that comes. And then last week we looked at, um, because uh, in St. Corinthians, because of the greatness of the ministry that we've been entrusted with. Um, you know, we have this glorious ministry, something that not even Moses had. We have something that's even, even bigger than anything that Moses had. And so because of that, we don't lose hope. We know that the message is, is great. It's life-changing. Well, tonight we're going to end... Well, before we go to that, um, um, so all these things, I think, I think we can summarize all these things. The core of all this is really because Jesus lives. Why shouldn't we give up? Because, because He lives, and uh, you know, I, I think that we these all these things really revolve around that fact. And Jesus is not just the hope of the resurrection. He's not just the hope of heaven. All those things; those are good things, yes. But Jesus is also our hope for continuing on. Uh, in life, when especially when you don't feel like there's anything left to to do, anything left to go. Um, so tonight we're going to close up with talking about Philippians. Uh, we'll start in one twenty one through twenty six, and uh, I don't know why I said we'll start there. We're only going to read Philippians one twenty one through twenty six, and uh, uh, it, it's a short book. If you if you have time this week, I just read it through a couple of times. Um, if you just sit, read it straight through, you can finish it in about fifteen minutes. Um, if you're really, really slow, it might take you an hour. Uh, I mean, I think one hour is not too long to read the Bible. You just give it a try and see, you know, what you can do. If you have a hard time reading, maybe your eyesight's going out. They have a lot of audible books, a lot of um, listing book Bibles. So, I mean, you, you do have options. Back in the day, we just kind of hope that somebody comes over and reads to you. Well, <laughs> we aren't living in those days anymore. So, uh, Philippians 1, 21 through 26. And I'll read through the whole thing, and then we'll go verse by verse, kind of like we did last week. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. And, you know, in all of us, we have that longing, that longing to depart. We long for a place where there's no problems. We long for a place where, you know, we can find joy and happiness and and we long for a place where we won't have our earthly pains and, and, and you know, our get up in the morning and fall cranky. That's heaven. That's, that's heaven. And right now it's the hope of glory for us, right? It's, it, we are running a race that we hope to finish well. Well, when that moment comes, it's, it's the race is finished. There's no more hope of glory. It's the realization of it. And, uh, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Now, Philippians is one of those books where if you read it when you're a kid, it means one thing, and it has a lot of really easy-to-remember verses. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, you know, the different things were really easy verses to memorize. But as you get older, they mean something different. Then as you start having health problems and, and age problems, which we all do, uh, it, mean, it means something completely different. And there are some things in this book that I never got 
uh, you know, I, I've been in ministry almost 20 years. It's 17 years. Uh, and there's some things that I really didn't get until the last about two years of ministry. <laughs> so <clears throat> if you're wondering how long you had to be in ministry before the Bible really starts to, I don't know, but 15 years on this part. So <laughs> you'll never know unless you try it, right? So first off this, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Something that I missed, and I, I, I this, this blew my mind, okay, because I've read these verses a thousand million billion times. Life isn't just pain. Now, this might, you might not see, like, well, what are you talking about? Just, just hold on. Have you ever been in that place where everything seems to be going wrong? You're like, life is nothing but pain. I'm doing nothing but losing. There's no, there's no winning left for me. Well, that's not what Paul says. For to me, to live is Christ. That means life isn't just pain. And I'm going to take this a step further for those of you who have served in ministry. Maybe you, maybe you didn't feel appreciated. Maybe you feel like your ministry failed. Whatever. Ministry isn't just disappointments. Are you getting what Paul is saying here? To live is Christ. Not to live is the grudge, uh, the, 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 the sledge, uh, you know, the, the daily going through the mud, which I call the trudge. Uh, and, and not the daily trudge through the mud. You know, this is, this is, this is more than that, okay? When, when we start getting the idea that ministry is nothing but problems and life is nothing but pain, it's our perception of reality that has changed, not reality. See, as we get old, as we were, when we were kids, these things were still happening. People were dying all around us, right? People were getting sick, just like before. Then we get older, we just notice it more. And so we spend all of our mature life looking back on all the suffering. See, life never changed. You think people just started dying and getting sick once you got older? You were doing it the whole time, <laughs> all around you. The only thing is when you were a kid, you weren't looking at that. You were looking at something else. You were looking in the distance. Right. Somewhere along the way, we lost our vi somewhere along the way we lost our vision. When we were kids, it was easier to serve God. It was easier to sing songs. And when we get older, we feel like, oh, we gotta, you know, we just feel kind of stupid. We gotta do things to, you know, make ourselves look cooler or whatever. And we just lose that bit. So let's just start at the real basic of this first. Life isn't just pain, and ministry isn't just disappointment. It's Christ. Now you might say, okay, so what does that mean for it to be Christ? Paul says this, to share in the life that starts here in this life and resurrection, that continues on into the next life, of Christ, we have to share in his sufferings. For me to live is Christ. It's part of fulfilling what God is trying to work in me in my character. You see that? To living is allowing God to allow to work character in me. It is sharing in the, in the, in the sufferings of Christ. So, so what does that mean? Well, it involves obeying God and suffering for it. Not just doing the right thing, but suffering for doing the right thing. If you've never done that, I don't, I don't know if you can say that you've really ever done ministry. 90% of ministry is trying to do what's right and getting mistreated for it. And that's not a sob story. That's just the way of life. When you, do the, when you do good things, like how many times as a kid did you have an opportunity to lie about somebody or to rat on somebody, and you would have gotten off scot-free, but you did the right thing, and you ended up getting in trouble for it? You ever did that as a kid? I know I did. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who did that as a kid. So we obey God and we suffer for it. That's part of that living as Christ. It's not something, oh, great, I have more problems to face today. No, no, no. We're going somewhere. To live is Christ. God is taking us somewhere. He's changing our character. He's working in us. It's not just another trudge. If you think that today is nothing but problems, you're missing the vision of what God has for you, for the community, for your family. You're caught up in yourself. And what do we learn about week one of the Never Give Up series? It's not about us. It's about God. When you make things all about you, of course, you're going to feel hopeless. But to live, living, living as Christ, it's not just obeying and suffering for it. It's also being humbled. We left on our own, you know, up to our own devices. We have a way of making ourselves kind of the most important person in our world. <laughs> Everything just has a way of revolving around us. We spend our money on us, our time on us. Well, God has a way of humbling us and, and pointing us back to him. 
you know, when you go through a hard time, God wants it, God wants it to be your motivation for seeking him. You get that? When you go through serious health problems, for instance, God wants you at the end of it to be closer to him than you were at the beginning of it. But what we do is we detach from God. We stop seeking him. We isolate ourselves from one another because it hurts, right? But that's not the way to grow, and that's not the purpose that God has for the pain. So it's being humbled. It's giving our life for others. True ministry, true Christianity. Which remember, we talked about this last week. All Christians are ministers. Not all are pastors, and that's fine, but all are ministers. As a Christian, we cannot live our life for ourselves, by ourselves. This is not what the Bible teaches. So, true ministry is giving our life for others. Just as Christ gave himself up for us, so also we give ourselves up, not just for our friends, but even for our enemies. That's something that First John talks about. Very important stuff that you don't get if you're not reading the Bible. I highly encourage you to stay in the Bible. You know, it'll take a little, it'll take a couple days of reading the Bible through before it starts to change the way you think and the way you feel, especially. But give it a couple days. It'll it'll start changing things. The problem is we want to read the Bible for five minutes on one day and think, okay, now there should be results. And there's not going to be results that quick. It just doesn't work like that. Um, and nothing really does. I mean, yeah, you can do drugs and it gives you a temporary high, but then you feel worse in the end. So, yeah, it re it reacted quicker, but then it left you in a worse state. When you see God, it doesn't do that, you know, um, what's it called? Roller coaster. It doesn't do that. It does like this. Slowly you start having improvements. But the thing is, is we go like this and we're like, okay, well, that was fun. I'm going to stop reading my Bible. Well, it's not taking us anywhere. You got to give it time. You got to seek God. Seeking God isn't just today I'm going to read my Bible and pray. It's changing your mindset to where God is the center of your life. So I can be proud of my struggles in life, and you can be proud of your struggles in life because why? Because they are badges of your service to Christ. Don't carry around your hurts and say, look at all the pain that I've suffered. No, no, no. Look at all the things that God has brought you through. As you go forward, yeah, it hurts. Do you know who makes the best pastors? The ones that have been hurt the most. When we're young and foolish, we think we can solve the whole of the world's problems. We think we can fix everybody. We think we're going to save the whole community. I'll be the pastor there for two years. And Chula Rosa will be nothing but Christians. And we'll be going out like a, locust, uh, a swarm of locusts saving everybody left and right. There'll be miracles here and there. And, and then your dreams die. And it's that death of the dream that makes you a truly good pastor because you learn how to keep going. And it's no longer about you and your dreams. It's about God and his vision. See, it just it changes. And so you start to grieve the loss of your naivete, your, the loss of your great plans. But it's not... It's like this. When we were young, our fathers did things for us. When we got older, we did them for ourselves. And we got, when we got even older still we started teaching our sons to do it. See how that works? We weren't meant to be babied from the, cra from the cradle to the grave. We were meant to be raised up so we could go and raise up other people. But that raising up only comes through the death of your vision, the death of what you had for your life, so that God can now do something better because now you have patience. Now you have clarity. These are things that can only happen through those painful things. But the problem is that we don't look at it that way. We just look at what we've lost. Anytime that there's change in your life, you're going you're gonna to lose something. But here's the bad news. Life is always changing. But here's the good news. That change is what made you able to move out of your parents' house, have your own family, get your own job. It's a good thing. It's just painful. It's a painful thing. For every life stage that you go through, you have to learn how to accept the pain, but keep going without carrying the pain. Because if you do nothing but carry the pain, you kind of lose your effectiveness because all you're focusing on is the pain. So I can be proud of my struggles, and so can you, because they are badges of your service to Christ. And I will say that a life of self-pleasure is anti-Christ. If our life is nothing more than self-pleasure, that is anti-Christ. It's anti-God. 
So when we spend all of our time not working, and I'm not just talking about physically, I'm also talking about spiritually. We're supposed to be spiritually working. We were created to do good, good deeds. When you spend all of our life's time just kind of sitting around doing nothing, not seeking God, not dying to self, just constantly gratifying ourselves, it's not about Christ at all. It's anti-Christ. But for too long, especially in America and more civilized places like Europe and whatnot, Christians have done these things where they've, okay, I'm saved, but that's just another stepping stone towards my success. And it's all about us and having the best house that we want, the best car that we want, all the things that we want. And somewhere along there, we forget that it's about Christ. And it changes us. Well, these little painful situations have a way of snapping us back to reality. Hey, wake up. It's, it's good. Well, you might think, well, I didn't need a, a wake-up call. Oh, didn't you, though? <laughs> didn't you? It's about, uh, I'm sorry, it's about Christ, not us. So to live, then, is, is Christ. But then he says this. He says, but to die is gain. Why is to die gain? Well, first off, I just want to point this out. He's not talking about suicide. He's not talking about taking your own life. Okay, just kind of clarify that. But then second off, it, to, to die is gain because you, grain, you gain Christ, Christ's righteousness, and you are no longer in danger of being disqualified from the race that you are running as a Christian. Every Christian is running a race. And when we die, we no longer have to worry about whether we're going to be disqualified. We no longer have to be on our guard and fi and, 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 and fighting that, 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 that good fight. So you could say that living is being part of a race. So your life, why shouldn't you give up? Because you're kind of partaking of something bigger than yourself. A race that has been going on for a couple thousand years and it really has a lot of purpose to it. And I will say that God is taking you to the next level as you go through the pains in your life. And that's a good thing, even if it's painful. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I, I don't know. So let's, let's look at this. Continuing, continuing living, continuing with your, with your ministry, continuing with trying to serve other people instead of just Screw them all. I'm gonna just going to do my own thing. Continuing to choose to put God first in your life. Continuing that. It means something. What it means is fruitful work. And you might say, well, what fruitful work can I possibly give? I, I'm not young and strong anymore. I, I, can't, I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't do that. Here's the thing. The reason why you're not getting this is because you're comparing yourself to all the things other people can do. But God didn't create us to compare ourselves to what someone else can do. He created us to use the gifts and talents that we uniquely have. Thanks to my new diseases and medications, I can't go outside in the sun. That's fun. Uh, I uh, can't lift a whole lot. I, 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 can't har I, I couldn't ride my bike more than once every, um, it was three, four days. Once every four days. Well, I pushed myself really, really, really hard, and now I can go out every single day, but I got to do follow a specific routine. I got to make sure I don't push myself too hard. I got all these different little loops and things that I got to go through, right? Well, my dad doesn't have any of those problems. He can go outside in the sun. He can he can lift however much he wants. I mean, probably shouldn't because he's getting older, but you get what I'm saying. But with that being said, but with that being said, can my dad play the guitar? Let me just, no, he can't. He can't. Now, why not? Why didn't God let him play the guitar? Well, because he gave that gift to me. See how that works? Everybody's going to have their own thing. So what we get is we get caught up in the things that we can't do. Here's the thing. There are numerous things that everybody can do. And I'll tell you, number one, being an example. When you are constantly overcome, constantly in the pit of despair, and you constantly keep turning your eyes back to Jesus, keep praying. I have this friend whose sister died of cancer. But before she died of cancer, she fought it for 20 years. And she was known for how hopeful she was. She didn't sit around and pout, oh, I have cancer. No, 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 that wasn't good enough. She kept her eyes on God. And I asked him, I said, how? How did she do this? And he said, 
she had her days, and when those days came, she prayed, she, keeps, she kept seeking God, and she kept going. That's it. Yeah, maybe you feel like you're overcome or whatever. Here's the thing. You just keep on seeking God. So the example of your life, not that you have everything together. When I was a kid, I, I thought that's what it meant to be an example to other people. You had to always have your ducks in a row, never mess up on anything. That's totally not what it means at all. You're not Jesus. You're not supposed to be, be perfect. You're not, not that you're not supposed to be perfect, but you're not going to be. You're not supposed to be Jesus, okay? You're supposed to be Jesus' disciple, okay? So just to kind of clarify things here. Uh, to be an example means that even though you mess up and even though you're not doing great and even though you suffer and struggle, you're still seeking God. You're still trying to do the right thing. You're not, you're not giving in to that cynicism. So you're an example. Uh, another thing that anybody can do, discipleship, you can, you can be discipled. You know how many Christians out there are unteachable? You would be surprised. Or another way of saying it is unpasturable. You'd be surprised how many people are unpasturable. They, they just go from church to church causing problems. They gossip and they complain and they nitpick and they find. You'd be surprised. I was surprised when I first got into ministry. I thought everybody that came to church wanted to grow. Oh, I was wrong. There's actually a substantial amount of people that wanted to go to church to have everything their way. <laughs> I did not know that back then. Well, time makes fools of us all, I guess. And uh, so anyways, that's something that everybody can do. Anybody can be discipled. Right now, no matter how sick or how well you are, you can allow yourself to be discipled. You can grow. And you can take opportunity to pour into other people's lives, too. You can witness to people about what Jesus has done in your life. Not just that, you know, hey, he took away all my problems. Well, what if he didn't take away all your problems? That's totally fine. I'm saying, uh, how does he carry you through with your problems? <laughs> And another thing anybody can do, and this if, if you are immobilized by pain, you can still do this. And it's probably the most important thing you can do. Pray. Prayer is something that is it's effective when a righteous person prays. James promises us that. It produces something when a righteous person prays. Maybe not exactly what they wanted every time. You know, it's not like a... You put the money in the coin thing and you twist it and the gumball comes out. You know what I'm talking about with the, the gumball machine, you know. It's not, it's not like that where you always know what's happening or you always know the mind of God or God's going to do it just because you're his favorite. It's not like that. It's like this. You pray and mountains just happen to be moved. Maybe you wanted the mountain to just become a valley, but maybe God instead just wanted to show you a way through the mountain. So these are all different, different fruitful work that God and that or fruitful labor, as it says in this translation, that God has for us. Don't don't let your physical limitations stop you from obeying God. So verses twenty three through twenty four. I am torn between the two, life and death. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is far more necessary for you that I remain in the body. So some important things he's saying here. It's necessary for others that we keep going. Did you get that? It is necessary for others that we keep. See, when, when we get to a point of stopping, right, ending the marriage, leaving the ministry, uh, ending our life, that point of just done, I'm giving up. When we reach that point where we, where we oftentimes forget is that it affects others. It's not just about us. It's necessary for others that we keep going. It means something to them. It teaches them something. Our kids learn by what we fight and what we accept. You can't fight a disease. You, it's just kind of there. But you can show your kids how to respond with the disease. I don't want my kids to say when, I, when they're older, I want them to say that their dad always you know, was on top of his his physical issues. I don't, I don't want them to say that. What I want them to say is, you know, dad had a heck of a hard time with it, but I remember he kept seeking God. He kept praying about it. That's what I want. I want to show my kids what it means to have faith. And I think, 
I think that's worth it. I think that's worth not giving up if I taught my kids faith. See, immature people, they're provided for. And I'm not trying to take jabs. Uh, this is just how it is. When, when you're a kid, you don't, you don't feed yourself. Your, your parents feed you. When you're a really little kid, you know, you got the whole breastfeeding thing or formula nowadays. That's the whole, you know, that's the stage of life. Well, as you get older and you become more mature, you provide for others. One of the most liberating things you can do is when you go to a job and you get paid and you learn how to not spend every dime and you start paying things off and you stop owing people money and you start paying your own bills and you you know I did this and it's just a really good feeling it it's easier i i've been on government assistance and off of it and i can tell you from experience it's easier to sleep when you're not being provided for by other people as a grown per, as a grown man it's a lot a lot easier because something in us was made to keep going and I, I feel bad for people because of physical health issues that they can't work a job and for that i would say this very simple thing i don't want to get political about any of this but if you have a physical limitation you cannot work I would highly recommend that you still do something that gets you out of the house serving someone else. Highly recommend it. Because if your life is all about your illness, it'll drive you insane. And that's all I'm going to say. So immature people, they're provided for. Well, mature people, they provide. See, it's, it's necessary for others. And that's one of the things that kept Paul going. Suicide, it doesn't end the hurt, it passes the hurt to someone else. Quitting, it doesn't make it where you succeed, it, it, it guarantees failure. Quitting is, is one of the best ways to guarantee failure. Th ministry and, 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 and this kind of, it's about them, it's not about us. You know, why don't I give up? Well, because I'm a married man who, who needs to be there for my wife, I need to be there for my kids. It's not about me. Well, I would much rather just go ahead and roll over and die. Well, once again, it's not about me. So in our living, we can help. We can help ministering to people, building up relationships with other people. Like I brought up a couple weeks ago, it it's always bothers me when I can keep stumbling my way forward and I read about another pastor who commits suicide. And it's like, you're not making it any easier for me, guy. <laughs> You know, it's some one of those things. But anyway, so we get to verses 25 and 26. And there's there's just something really good here that I, that I really want to focus on. But let me read it first. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain. And I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the face that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. So there's something really, really, really powerful here that I missed until I started having problems. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you. Why? For your progress. Now, why is this important? Why is this powerful? Because Paul's decisions were based on his purpose. Paul made life decisions according to his purpose. You see what he just said? He has this purpose right? And he's making a decision based on that purpose. Okay, now hold on here. He's not basing his decision on his own happiness. Okay, now let me kind of unpack what I'm trying to say here, okay? When we move, when we switch jobs, what is usually our underlying foundation for that? Is it because of our sense of purpose or our sense of happiness? I'm not happy there, so I'm going to go to a different job. I'm going to move because I'm not happy. We make an event the destination of our life. I'm going to move to this place. Why are you going to move over there? Oh, I don't know. See, if you move, that's okay. It sh the move should be based from your purpose. You are being driven by God to a certain place, so you are moving to fulfill that 
that call that God has on your life versus I'm bored, so I'm going to move. See the difference? The move became the destination. It became the event itself. Life was about that event. But when you are moved by your sense of purpose, that is just a stepping stone in the journey. And that's exactly what Paul is saying. Paul is making his decisions based on his purpose that he got from God, not his own personal happiness. Because he just said, it would be a lot better for me if I would just die. We make events our purpose in life instead of allowing our purpose to define events. Like I said, moving as a stepping stone towards the destination, not the destination itself. Well, I'm bored, so I'm going to buy another house. Well, why are you going to do that? Because I'm bored. You know, we, we make it all about this thing. Talk to people. Try this experiment at home. Go talk to your friends who are about to move and say, hey, why are you, why are you moving? They'll say, I, I, it's nice out there. Okay, I mean, there's problems everywhere that you go. Is you just moving because it's a nice place? I mean, okay. See what I mean? It's not based off of, off of a purpose. They're just doing it because they lack purpose. And when we lack purpose, we try to fill it with all kinds of different things. But Paul shows us here that the correct way to go about life decisions and life events is to base them from your purpose. Paul's purpose was to strengthen their faith. See, it wasn't about Paul. It, it wasn't about his suffering or what he lost. For Paul, it was about them. And he was making decisions based off of that perfect purpose. So when I say that God has a purpose for you, I mean he has a purpose for you, but it's not going to revolve around your personal happiness. And if you chase your happiness, not only will you not find your happiness, but you also won't have a purpose in life guaranteed every time. The quickest way to be happy is to make somebody else happy. Did you know that? And the quickest way to get bored of life really, really quick is when you don't have a reason for anything. You just go wandering around from thing to thing. So how does any of this apply to you? Well, there's a few things. Why shouldn't you give up? First off, your living is fruitful. Why shouldn't you give up in chronic pain? Why? I mean, hey, it's a constant pain just to be alive. Why not just give up? Because your living is fruitful. When you're in pain, you can offer prayers that people out, not in pain haven't even thought of praying. You get that? When you are in pain and hurting, you have an open door of ministry that other people don't even dream about having because they don't understand what a wonderful thing it is that you've been given. Remember, life, life is a limited thing anyways. So yeah, you spend a couple days stumbling around, crying around the house, and you get back up and you go. That's just the way things are. Because it's not about you. It's about God. It was never about you. And that's one of the reasons why we're not happy in life. Because we think it's all about us. We have made us the central character in our story. But we're actually just a minor character in God's story. God is the one who decides. He's the, he's the great mover. And something will come of it. And we have a ministry that has been entrusted to us. And these are things, these are things worth, worth chugging on for. So in life, we come to this point and we say, you know, I, I'm losing. I, I'm doing nothing but losing. I, I'm just, I'm losing. I'm losing people. I'm losing things. I've got nothing to show for it. I'm just, I'm in a stage in my life where I'm do, doing nothing but losing. Or you get to a point of frustration, you say, I'm only ever losing. It's an uphill battle, I'm only ever losing. Well, here's the thing, and I want you to get this. Paul didn't see it like that. Paul felt like he was always gaining. And that's exactly what we read about in Philippians 1, 21. You are always gaining. If you live, if you die, it's a gain. So whenever you get to the point of saying, you know, I'm just in constant pain, I'm only ever losing. Remember... No, to live is Christ. You are gaining. God showed Paul that he wasn't a waste of space. It's, it's time that you learn to listen and believe what God says about you. Paul did, and it changed his life. He was able to do things with purpose. 
You were created with purpose, not for a purpose, okay? It's not this one thing that you were born to do. That's not what I'm getting at at all. Your life inherently has purpose in it. You were created with purpose. Your existence is purpose-driven. Everything you do comes from what you are. When we rest in what God has done in our forgiveness and how he's changing our life, and instead of thinking that we are getting our own selves to heaven, and we rest in that, and we just seek God, we are free to do things without the weight of guilt and shame. We're able to do things without wondering, oh, have I earned my place in heaven yet? Is, am I good enough for God's forgiveness? We get to get past that, and we just say, it's about God, not me. And we're able to get to a point where we can do something from the purpose that we inherently have within us to minister. That is a purpose we all, each and every one of us has within us. Well, I'm just trying to find my purpose in life. Well, tell me when you find it, because I haven't found mine yet. But I do know this, that God has given me skills that I can use to build other people up. If I could summarize what your calling is in one short sentence, I would do it like this. Encourage others. Lord, we thank you for everything you're doing in our lives and through us. Yeah, I pray you'd help us all to remember never to give up. Help us to remember and treasure your words from Philippians, Lord. Lord, we, we, we need to know that it's all about you. Help, remind us that life is more than pain. Ministry is more than disappointments. Remind us, God, that there's something bigger. And Lord, help us... Help us to make decisions based on purpose, not based on happiness or personal squabbles. Lord, we thank you for everything you're doing in us and through us. We thank you, Lord. You're a good God. Amen.